we're not going to talk about some important. We're going to talk about, I don't know, salvation, right? We're looking today. We're, all right, so here's what's going to happen over the next two weeks and then, and then the week after that and then, and then the, the coming of the next sermon of the, uh, the highly imperial arch grand poobah himself. The artist formerly known as P. Diddy, right, is going to preach for you. That is uh, June the 18th. 1 8, June 18th. See, he's ready. He's prepared. His message is crafted. He's going to give you both barrels of the shotgun. He's ready. All right, so before that, we're going to take a little hiatus from the day of the Lord, and we're going to look at does my life bear the evidence of salvation out of 1 John? That'll be part one this week, part two next week. Then we'll finish up the, the dreaded and, uh, and doom filled day of the Lord uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5. That'll be the, the 11th. And then the 18th, Daniel will be preaching, and Chris and I are going to play hooky that whole weekend. So, All right. Does my life bear the evidence of salvation, part one? We're looking at 1 John 1, 5 through 10. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Now, as you can tell from the title of this sermon, our topic today is not for the faint of heart. All right? It is not what could be classified as a seeker-sensitive type of sermon, Right? Well, that makes sense because very little of what we ever teach here at this church can be classified that way, but this one especially is not seeker-sensitive, okay? Hopefully, however, today's sermon is going to challenge you and I to do some things. Hopefully, it's going to challenge us to examine ourselves, right? And then after we examine ourselves, we're either going to confirm in our hearts that our faith in Jesus Christ is real and legitimate, or it's going to inspire us to acknowledge that our lives do not bear the evidence of salvation. Like I said, heavyweight sermon today. So again, let me just raise that one more time. We're gonna we're gonna examine ourselves based on this sermon, and then either our faith is gonna be found legitimate, or our faith is gonna be found lacking, and then hopefully, led by the Holy Spirit, we're gonna do something about it. Okay. All right. So with all that heaviness in mind, I want you to listen to some more heavy words, but not Thomas's heavy words. We're gonna listen to Jesus Himself. Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, do many miracles in your name, and then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. These words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, they are blunt. They're kind of shocking. And unfortunately, they still apply today to people who profess to have faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Plainly stated, this is going to go as a shock to everybody today, but plainly stated, everyone who says I'm saved, everyone who professes to have faith in Jesus Christ, whether they go to church or not, whether they tithe or not, whether they do nice things or not, whether they can spell Jesus without a dictionary or not, right, those kind of things, whether or not those are true or false, everyone who says I'm saved is not necessarily saved. Well, who would say something mean like that? Well, that would be the guy who's doing the saving. His name is Jesus, right? Later on in Matthew 13, Jesus taught that the kingdom of heaven is like a field. This field was planted with good seed. But at harvest time, this field was found to be filled with not only wheat, the good stuff, but also weeds as well. Now, the wheat and the weed look nearly identical while they're growing in the field. It is extremely difficult to differentiate between them until they reach maturity, until it's time to harvest. So that it makes us ask this question, what's the difference between the wheat and the weed in this parable? Although the weed looks like wheat, when you open it up, there's no grain inside. Inside of the tear, inside of the weed, it's empty. Such is the case with the unsaved person who professes Christianity. I mean, on the outside, looks like a duck, acts like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck, right? That's, how, that's, how we, that, that's science in, in our lifetime, right, 2023. So you apply that to this professing Christian. Well, they, well, they walk like a Christian. And they taught whatever that walk looks like. I walk like a paraplegic, but they walk like a Christian, right? They talk like a Christian, right? They act like a Christian. Got to have at least one Parkinson's joke. 
Just one. All right. In reality, though, on the inside of this professing believer, their faith is lacking, and they are not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. On the inside of this professing believer, they are like the weed. They're empty. Okay? So in the modern church, there are many reasons why church folks, with the little quotes on it, church folks, right? There's many reasons why church folks may actually not be saved. Here's some of the ones I came up with. Some of them have what's called a head full of theology. They have head knowledge. But the real belief of Jesus Christ is not in their heart. They know all the answers. They know when Thomas says this, they say amen. They know when the right thing comes along at the right time, they go, yep, that's right. They, they recognize the correct answers. They would, they would pass the test. Give them a little scantron sheet. They'll, they'll put the bubbles in on the right answers every single time, right? Others are convinced that they're good people, and they believe that somehow they've earned a trip to heaven. Now, these same people in church will amen grace, and they'll amen mercy, and they'll hear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they'll go, that's right, Thomas, you tell them. But on the inside, where it counts, somehow they have convinced themselves that, yes, all are sinners and all fall short of the glory of God, and ain't I glad I'm not one of them, right? Everybody needs Jesus' grace, grace, God's grace, except for me, because I've earned something, right? They're trying to be good people and earn a trip to heaven on their own. And then still other professing believers somehow believe that they are saved by what I'm going to call church culture. I mean, I was raised in church. I mean, I I grew up in a neighborhood next to a church. I mean, my daddy drove his car past the church. What we hear in the neighborhood one time, my granddaddy owns a church. We heard that in the the neighborhood when we were sharing Jesus one time, right? They're somehow saved by the culture of church or or an affiliation, in other words, with church. Yep, I know five people, and they go to church every Sunday, right? For some reason, I have this church culture, and it has migrated like, like so much, much grass in my front yard, it just kind of crawled right over to this bare spot and filled everything in, right? What, what, what kind of grass is that? Centipede to crawl? Say again? Bermuda. Bermuda. Final answer. The grass expert told me that. All right. But none of these objects that we've been talking about are objects of saving faith. They're not genuine. I mean, you can put your faith in them. They're objects of faith, yes, but not objects of saving faith, right? Only faith in Jesus Christ can justify a sinner in the eyes of God. So now let's get some context for our passage. John is writing this epistle. That means he intended it to be read by us later on. He's writing this epistle first to believers in Asia Minor. Okay, first century believers in Asia Minor. This letter is an attempt to correct heretical doctrines of false teachers, and these false teachers have risen to prominence in the church. You've got this new religion, Christianity, that is just taking the Roman Empire over by storm, right? So, of course, if it's drawing a crowd, of course, if it's gaining influence, of course, if I think I can monetize it or use it in some way to make myself more powerful, I'm going to jump on board. But when I jump on board, i got to change it just a little bit. i got to craft it just a little bit. i got to make sure that I'm the one that's on top when it's all said and done. So these false teachers, in essence, were peddling another gospel, right? They weren't peddling... I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. They were peddling another gospel. And and by by default, they were peddling a different Jesus. Okay? But they still called themselves Christian. And many in the actual Christian church were either falling for the lies, or they were at least, at at the bare minimum, they were confused about what is the status of my salvation. When the actual apostles came through and they shared this This gospel of Jesus Christ with me, I placed my faith in them, and I got saved. But then this other guy comes along, and he's well-funded, and he seems to have letters of recommendation, and he dresses nice, right? He's got his own television. He's got like a YouTube channel. He's influencing people, and and all of a sudden, I'm I'm confused. I don't know. Am I saved anymore? He's saying something different. Well, who do I believe? So either they were falling for the lies, or they were confused about who do I believe? So for that reason, John laid out in this letter several ways to test whether their lives bore the evidence of genuine genuine salvation. If you read the entire letter of 1 John, the entire epistle, it's one test after another. If this, if this, if this, then you belong to God. If this, if this, if this, then you're in trouble. Over and over and over again, all throughout the letter. 
He wants them to, to cut through the confusion. He wants them to see this is what real salvation is. This is what the real gospel is. This is the real result of having genuine faith in Jesus Christ. And once these tests were performed by, by, by these, these recipients of this letter, they would not only know, do I truly belong to God or not, but they would also know whose teachings were orthodox and worth submitting to. So it's, it's a twofold kind of result there. First, they're going to figure out, do I actually belong to God? And second, they're going to figure out, well, who do I need to start listening to now? Okay, so there's your context. So as we study what I'm going to call the perfect, inerrant, infallible word of God this morning, right? I hope that each and every one of us is going to ask ourselves a difficult, possibly frightening question. Every one of us, including the big, ugly, ball guy on, on the platform right now. Does my life bear the evidence of salvation? Is the bear up yet? No, the bear's coming. Bear. You didn't do the bear after all? Mm. She was working on a PowerPoint last night. And, <laughs> you know, to bear something in, in like, a, like, a, like a brown furry bear, like Yogi Bear bear. Uh, they're spelled the same way. So every time I looked over at her uh, computer, she had like a bear up on, like a bear picture. Oh, the power. I thought Crystal was like, like, watch this. Like, Thomas is going to be all serious, and then Yogi Bear is up there with a little necktie. You just, like, spin it up. <laughs> <laughs> with a picnic basket. <laughs> Boo-boo, right? Exactly. All right, anyway. Let's go back to the Word of God. That seems to be more important right now than a bear. All right, First John 1, 5 through 10. First John 1, 5 through 10, no bear, right? All right, now. Now, this is the message we have heard from him, that's Jesus, and declared to you. That's the churches in Asia Minor. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. <clears throat> but if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and... The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Right. So let's look at how this thing begins. It starts out in verse five. Now, this is the message we have heard from him and now declared to you. John says, this is the message that we have heard from him and we're declaring to you. The message here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's talking about this is the gospel I heard and the gospel that I'm sharing with you. Just in case you forgot, just in case the false teachers are stirring up confusion, just in case you're sitting there and you're worried about whether I'm saved or not, this is the gospel I received and the one that I delivered to you. Okay? What follows in verse 5 is intended to be an expansion of or a further explanation of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? He says the statement, we have heard from him. In case you didn't catch it by the, by the capital letter, the him there is Jesus, right? John is now distancing himself from the false teachers, distancing himself from the early Gnostics, distancing himself from, from, the, from the Greek philosophers. He's saying, this is what I heard straight from Jesus, right? These people who are infecting the church don't listen to them. I am speaking from authority, John says. John's authority as an apostle didn't come from some letters that he had and from, from, from important people in Jerusalem or from the Judeo uh, church or from the Sanhedrin. He was preaching on the authority of Jesus himself. Jesus gave John that authority. Therefore, the original recipients of this letter, as well as the church today, we're able to trust what John says. That's all he means when he says that. I got this from him, Jesus, and I gave it to you. What he's saying is, since I got it from Jesus, you can trust me. Don't trust the weirdness. Don't trust the false stuff. Trust what Jesus told me. I'm relaying what Christ said. All right? Then he says, God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. 
So right here, John makes a statement concerning the nature of God. God is light. And that statement right there is the foundation of everything that follows in this passage. God is light. Okay? It's a, it's a pillar of everything, a cornerstone of everything that's going to follow in the rest of these verses. Now, notice that John declares God is light. He doesn't say God is the light. He doesn't say God is a light. He doesn't say God is my favorite light, right? By stating that God is something, John is expressing to us that this particular characteristic concerns the very essence or the very nature of who God is. God is light. So let's talk about light and darkness in Scripture. More often than not, not always, right? But more often than not, the words like light and darkness are used metaphorically in Scripture, okay? Unfortunately, these two terms are also used to symbolize what I'm going to call a laundry list of very interrelated concepts. So here's your possibles. He says, God is light. So he could possibly mean God is life, eternal life, our witness, goodness, holiness, ethics, morality, purity, openness, revelation, exposure of truth, the glory of God, truth itself, and the kingdom of God. And there are many more. I just kind of stopped, okay? When he talks about darkness later on in the passage, he could be referring to death, eternal condemnation, evil, sin, ungodliness, immorality, deception, withholding of revelation, and the kingdom of Satan, again, just to name a few, all right? Our job this morning is to nail down specifically what these metaphors of light and darkness are intended to mean in this passage. What do they mean in this passage? So now we have to ask a question. What's this overall passage talking about? What's the point of this overall passage? The overall passage, the, the literary context of this passage, speaks of the Christian lifestyle. How do I get there? What does he say? He says, walk in darkness, practicing the truth. Truth is a synonym for light, right? Walk in light. Over and over again, he's using these lifestyle terms, right? Obviously, light and darkness are being used in this passage in the ethical and moral sense, okay? So when John says God is light, it means he's holy. It means God is ethical. God is moral. And all the church said, well, I hope so, right? In other words, what he's saying is that God only does good. He only does what is synonymous with and consistent with that laundry list of good things that light symbolizes. He does, he lives a life that is completely and totally good. And when John says God has absolutely no darkness in him, it means that God cannot do something that is not good. He cannot be the opposite of good. He cannot be immoral. He cannot be unethical. He cannot be sinful. Why? Because there's literally no shred of evil within him. All good, all the time, right? So with this understanding of the nature of God in mind, what's that understanding? God is light. God is good. God is ethical and moral. God can't be anything opposite of that, right? With that nature of God statement in mind, John now argues against many of these false claims that the false teachers are making in Asia Minor. But at the same time, He's providing the church with three characteristics of the genuine Christian life. Three characteristics of the genuine Christian life. In other words, he's already started out the beginning of this letter with a test. Take this test and see, does my life, that's right. I saw Lorena about to go take the test. You can't do that. I got, I got to take a sip of coffee now. I was thinking it, if that makes you feel any better. While I was saying, take the test, I was thinking it. Okay. <sighs> Movie reference, sorry. All right. So he's basically saying, take this test of salvation. See, does your life, see, you got me giggling now. See, he's asking, does your life measure up to this test? 
Do you pass this test? Does your life resemble what this test is talking about? Does your life have these three characteristics of a genuine Christian life? So it starts off in verse 6 and all the way through 7. It says, if we say, he's talking about Christians now, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, empty, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So he starts off, if we say, three different times in this passage, John's going to begin a thought with a conditional phrase, if we say, right? And each of these thoughts represent a false concept, or a false doctrine of the heretical teachers that have risen to power in the early church. Every time he says, if we say, he's kind of paraphrasing a false concept, right? He starts off by saying, if we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness. Now, for a variety of reasons that I don't have time to go through today, the false teachers in the churches of Asia Minor in the first century, they taught basically for many different reasons, but basically they taught one thing all in common. They taught that a person could have a legitimate salvation in Jesus Christ, legitimate saving faith in Jesus Christ, and at the same time living a life that, that is characterized by all manner of evil. Okay? You're saved by this faith that I'm, I'm talking about, the false teacher says, and you just do what you want, right? Just do what you want. John uses this word walk the way everybody in the New Testament uses it, to describe the way a person lives their life. When you say walk in something, it's have a lifestyle characterized by that something. Okay? To walk in darkness means that a person's lifestyle is presently, habitually, and progressively characterized by a heart and a conduct that opposes the morality of God. Remember what he said? God is light. So if you walk habitually, presently, progressively, to the core of your very heart in darkness, in what is anti-God, then it's a good indication that you don't belong to God. That's the point being made here. And as we're going to discuss in a minute, this does not mean that a genuine Christian will never sin. That's not what this passage is saying. It's taught that way sometimes, that a genuine Christian will never sin. All you have to do is pick a beaconite and follow them home today. And I'm assuming before we even get to lunch, right, before we even get to lunch. Yesterday, uh, moving uh, uh, Ashland in, it was before I even got up the stairs the first time. Before I even got up the stairs the first time. Already I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right, Thomas is a sinner. You see what I'm saying? It's not saying that a person who has faith in Jesus Christ is not going to sin. We'll talk about that more in a minute. All right. But it does mean that as a sinner will long to conform to the standard of God. As a sinner, I'm a believer. As a sinner, I have faith in Jesus Christ. As a sinner, I'm still indwelled by the Holy Spirit, and I'm in this process of becoming this new creation. I'm in this process of becoming more and more like Jesus. So I'm going to long, desire, want to conform to the standards of God. I'm going to mess up, but at least I'm going to want to. I'm going to desire it. And progressively, I'm going to become more and more holy as my life goes on, I'm never going to be sinless. I'm never going to get there, not until I, 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 I pass and I'm given a glorified body in heaven. But on the way, I'm going to become more like Jesus. I'm going to be conformed more into his image, right? And the big part is in my heart, I'm going to desire better. I'm going to desire light. I'm not going to desire darkness habitually, presently, continually, and progressively, right? When we profess salvation and then live a life that is characterized by what is anti-God, John says we're lying. We say with our mouth that I belong to God. And then we live with our life that I am anti-God. Therefore, we're lying, right? In other words, our profession of saving faith is a lie. Sometimes it's a lie to yourself. It's a delusion, right? Sometimes you think you're saved. And you've never bothered to take the test, so to speak. You've never bothered to look at your life. You've never bothered to take your life and lay it next to what the Bible says this is what a Christian life looks like. And therefore, you're lying to yourself, right? Sometimes you're lying to other people. Oh, yeah, I'm saved. Just to shut them up. 
just to be part of the crowd, just to be part of the church, right? But he goes further and says, and are not practicing the truth. Not only are we professing a lie, but what we're actually living, what we're actually practicing on a regular basis is not the truth, right? Notice John emphasizes practicing the truth. He's talking about a concept that the Apostle James also spoke on. Look at James 2, 14 through 19. James 2, 14 through 19, also a passage that is often mispreached, misapplied, and misunderstood. So that's flag number one. All right. James 2, 14 through 19, right? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? That has an obvious answer, right? No good. That's a rhetorical question. That, that's a sass question. That's a snot question is what that is. <laughs> What good is it, James says, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? Not can faith save him. Can this kind of faith save him? If a brother or a sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well. In other words, you give them a big box of no help, right? But you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? Right? What you're saying doesn't match what you're living. In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. Not that faith doesn't save. Not that faith isn't the only way to be saved. The kind of faith that's being described is dead because it has shown itself to be dead. It has the evidence that it is dead, right? But if someone will say, you have faith and I have works, Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith from my works. In other words, I'm going to show you that I have, I have saving faith because the evidence of my saving faith is there. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. James is making a point. He says, listen, you're not saved by works. You don't earn your way in. It's all a gracious gift. But real faith is going to equal a life that wants to please God. Real faith is going to equal a life that recognizes frailty, recognizes sinfulness, recognizes corruption, recognizes hypocrisy, and then desires and longs and wants to do something about it, wants to follow after the Holy Spirit, wants to conform to the Bible, right? The evidence of saving faith is a life that is characterized by good works. Now... John will give us the contrast to a false profession of faith, right? Started out with the false profession of faith, right? I have this, this awesome faith, but I'm lying because I'm not practicing the truth. Here's the contrast to that. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. To walk in the light is to live a life that desires and attempts to imitate the holy, sinless example of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. God, per our passage, is light. Therefore, if I'm walking in the light, I'm trying to imitate and walk and live and practice and have conduct like Jesus, right? So to walk in the light is to live a life that desires and attempts to imitate this holy, sinless example of Jesus Christ. John's point here is very plainly stated, I think. He, in essence, is saying genuine believers pursue righteousness. Genuine believers pursue righteousness. They don't always get it. They don't always accomplish it. They fail on the regular, and that's what the second half of the passage is about, right? But right now, genuine believers pursue righteousness. So let's take a second here and be very careful, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this nail many times. I'm going to do it per the manuscript. I'm going to do it just as I feel, feel led to. But it's very important not to take this passage and preach it wrong. This passage in its entirety, does not teach you that if you profess faith in Christ and you still have some kind of sin in your life that you're lost. I'm going to say that one more time. This is not, capital N-O-T, not saying that if you profess Jesus and you still mess up, that you're lost. It's not saying that. Instead, it teaches us that a genuine believer, while still actually being a sinner that messes up, actually chases after the righteous life. And their life as a whole is characterized by works that are good in the eyes of God. Not perfection, not sinlessness, but a life that wants to be better. A life that wants God. 
a life that desires to imitate Christ. Right? So the main point here is if you profess Jesus Christ and at the same time you completely disregard his word or you completely disregard his will or you have no desire to honor his name with a lifestyle that pleases him, if that's you, if you're the person that says, well, I hear what God said, but I don't care. I hear what God said. It doesn't make any difference to me. I hear what God said, but it's almost, I mean, it's almost 12, and then I won't worry about it until next week. If that's where your head's at, if that's where your heart's at, if that's where your conduct is, then regardless of what you say, you can say, I know Jesus all day long. And you can say, well, I wrote a tithe check yesterday. And you can say, well, I'm a member of this mega church, the Beacon Church. You can say all these things, right? But what you can't say and be honest is that I'm saved. Right? You're actually lost. If you have a complete disregard for his will, a complete disregard for his word, no desire to imitate his life, no desire to honor him with your life, if that's where you're actually living and only you knows that, then regardless of what you say, John says you're lost. Look at Matthew 7, 15 through 20. <clears throat> Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. This is Jesus talking now. How are you going to recognize somebody that's not worth listening to? You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by your fruit. We can determine the genuineness of our own faith by examining the fruit of our lives. Again, not a statement of perfection. Again, not a statement of, well, I, I never returned. Like I, like, I, like I sinned once and I'm over that and I'm past it. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a heart that desires better, a heart that longs for God's word, a heart that longs to love the church, a heart that longs to be what God would have him be, a heart that longs to emulate Jesus, to imitate Jesus, right? That's what's being talked about, this desire. And that desire alone will characterize, right? It will result in works that characterize you as belonging to Jesus Christ. How do I know whether I belong to Jesus Christ? Well, do I pursue righteousness? Let's go the converse way. Here's the, here's the easier way. Here's the less muddy way. You ready? Do I even care about righteousness? Like I'm sitting here today. What, someone give me what time it is. What time is it? 11.36 a.m. Sunday, May the 28th. Sitting here right now. I'm going to get nasty with it. You ready? Do you give a crap about righteousness? Do you care? Does it cross your mind? Are you worried about it slightly? When you, when you think of righteousness, do you equate it with God's word? Do you read God's word? Do you care about God's word? Can you spell the word word? Right? You see what I'm saying? Are you in your life right now? Does righteousness matter? If you're not pursuing righteousness on some level, you've already failed the test. That's what John is saying. You can determine the genuineness of saving faith by the fruit of our lives. That's not a statement of perfection. That's a reality that if I belong, I'm going to want to belong. If I belong, I'm going to want to please who I belong to. I'm going to fail all the time. But I'm going to want better. I'm going to desire better, right? So again, please don't misunderstand. This passage is not also attempting to challenge us to attempt to imitate Christ in our own power. This is how it's often preached. Now I'm on soapbox. I'm coming off the manuscript. Forgive a brother, right? But I'm, I'm just telling you right now, many people see this passage and they talk about how you're supposed to pursue righteousness and then they pick up a big, big stick with legalism written on top of it and start smacking you in the forehead with it, okay? That is not what this passage is talking about. It is not telling you, hey, you're not a good enough person. You're not a good enough Christian. So you know what you need to do? You need to try to be better all on your own. You need to try to be better all in your own power. You need to try to say the right things and do the right things and be the right things and make sure somebody sees you so they know you're doing the right things. That is not what this passage is talking about. Walking in the light on a daily basis requires something supernatural, okay? Walking in the light as a lifestyle is something you can't do on your own. It's something you can't accomplish on your own. It is other than you. It is otherworldly. It is supernatural. It is above what is your natural inclination to sin. 
See what I'm saying? Walking in the light requires you to be empowered and led by God the Holy Spirit who indwells you. You can't do it on your own. So this passage is not saying, listen to my words, this passage is not saying be better. It's not saying that. It's not saying you, you, you suck as a Christian, be better. That is not what this passage is talking about. Look at Galatians 5, 16 through 26, because Paul is now going to say amen. You ready? And by the way, while you're reading this passage in Galatians 5, 16 through 26, while you're reading it, walk by the Spirit is equal to when John says walk in the light. Walk by the Spirit is equal to what John says walk in the light. Paul walked by the Spirit. John walked in the light. Same statement. I say then, this is Paul, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. Yeah, my Parkinson's tongue is working today. Y'all heard that, right? I tell you about these things in advance, Paul says, as I told you before, that those who practice such things, characterized by all that stuff, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, why is that? Because the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a saved person is different. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. And the God rocks are singing in my head right now. Right? That little cartoon. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, we must also follow the Spirit. We must not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Right. So again, one more time before I go on to the next point. Now, this passage did not say, hey, professing Christian, you suck. Do better. That is not what this passage is saying. You understand? Not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying, look at your life. If you don't have a desire for his word, if you don't have a desire for his will, if you don't have a desire to emulate Jesus in the slightest, if you don't want to pursue righteousness in the slightest, well, chances are it's because you don't have a relationship with him who is righteous. See what I'm saying? That's what it's talking about. Number two, last one tonight. Today, this afternoon, nobody knows what time, right? Genuine believers love the body of Christ. Genuine believers, and they have to drink a coffee because we're just confused night and day. Right. Ah, all right. Genuine believers love the body of Christ. Love me some church, genuine believers. Right. Notice in verse seven, one result of walking in the light is that we have fellowship with one another. We Christians, people who have faith in Jesus Christ, we have fellowship with one another. Now, at first glance, this, this statement seems Odd, or at least it does to me, because I, I think things odd sometimes. We might expect John, or I might expect, Thomas expects John to say, well, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God. That seems to be what would be the logical conclusion to that sentence, right? If we walk in the light, we are saved. That's what you would think it would say, right? Like right off the bat. Like that should be the next statement. Like, John, why didn't you call Thomas up? Because Thomas would have helped you write that better, right? It should say... If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God. But look back at John's reason for writing this letter in the first place. He goes, Thomas, wait, wait, wait. I had a reason for writing this letter, Thomas. 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you may have fellowship along with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Again, Instead of starting with fellowship with God, who does he start with? Fellowship within the church. To walk in the light is truly evidence that one has genuine fellowship and salvation with Jesus Christ. We just, we just covered that. But the obvious result of a love relationship with Jesus is a love relationship with his body, the church. Say that again. If I have a love relationship with the head of the church then according to this passage, I'm going to have a love relationship with the body, the church, the bride of Jesus Christ, right? 
To walk in the light is evidence that one has genuine salvation in Jesus, but the result of that walking in the light, the result of that true, genuine salvation is I'm going to love the church. I'm going to have this fellowship with people in the church. So now it's time to be challenging, right? I realize that many genuine Christians have been hurt by the church. Go figure. In fact, here, I'm going to put my hand up. That's me. Anybody who ain't been hurt by the church, put your hand up. That's what I thought, right? Church hurts. Church stinks. Because we're a collection of sinners. And that's what we do. We sin against each other, right? So I realize when I'm saying this that many genuine Christians, many really saved, Bible-believing, love from Jesus, righteousness-pursuing Christians have been drastically, drastically hurt by the church. And many of those Christians have become disenfranchised for a variety of legitimate and sometimes petty reasons, right? Sometimes those reasons are legitimate, and sometimes those reasons have a lot to do with the dude in the mirror, okay? But their reasons done the same, and they are disenfranchised. And I am not claiming to you that you have to be a faithful, active member of a church to be saved. That is not scripture. You do not, not have to be a member of a church, an active member of a church, an involved member of a church, a faithfully attending member of a church to be saved. That is not what we're talking about. But God's word here is plain. If I have a legitimate saving faith in Christ and I attempt to live like Christ, then I'm going to have fellowship with his church. If I belong to him through salvation and if I'm attempting to live like him in the victorious Christian life, by default, by result, I'm going to have fellowship with his church. Okay, so at best, professing believers who despise the church are sinning against the one who saved them. That's real. I was there once for about six years. Okay, the whole the whole uh, the, the the last couple years I was engaged, and the first couple years of marriage, at least at the very minimum, four or five years, I was disenfranchised from the church. They're a bunch of hypocrites. They make me crazy. They make my head pop off. And therefore, I don't want nothing to do with them. I was sending money to them in the mail and wasn't having anything to do with them in church, right? So, I mean, I get it. And at that time, guess what? I was sinning. I was sinful. At worst, a professing believer who despises the church has this reality. You ready? They can't love the church because they're lost and the love of God is not in them. They profess to be saved. They hate the church, want nothing to do with the church, despise the church, can't spell church because it makes their mouth taste bad, right? If that's the case, probably because they're lost and the love of God doesn't live in them in the first place. It's easy to hate the church when you don't belong to it, right? Look at an example of the ideal church in Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. This is the church right after the, the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost. You ready? So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Listen to what happens next. Now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all people, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Now this passage that I just read is not saying, all right, time to join the Beacon Commune, right? (laughs) Sell all your junk. I'll give you an account. You can transfer all your money to it, and we'll go live on a lake house somewhere. Not Lake Murray. That's too many people there. We've got to go find them. We've got an isolated lake somewhere, right? <laughs> Mountainside, maybe put the compound fence up, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. This is not a passage that says, hey, it's a commune. That's what we need. No, this is not Waco, Texas. I promise. This is not, okay? I said it. That happened. It happened. It was where it happened, didn't it? Anyway. What I am saying is that look at the fellowship and the love they have for each other. They get for real saved, and they have this for real Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they have all of that in common, right? We all have faith in the same Jesus. 
We all are indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. We all have the same mandate. We're all trying to accomplish the same goals. We all have the th- all these things in common. So therefore, whether I like it or not, it's like family, right? I'm stuck with you. So I might as well break bread with you. I might as well love you instead of loving myself. I might as well treat you like a brother and a sister. I might as well have fellowship with you. That's what's happening. This is the first Christian church. First Christian church. And look what's happening. They are fellowshipping with one another because they love Jesus and the love of God lives in them and the Holy Spirit indwells them because they really are saved. They can't help but love the church. Do you reckon in Acts 2, in this church in Jerusalem, do you reckon there are any busybodies? Reckon any nosy ones in there? Derogatory people, prickly people that are hard to live with. You reckon any of them are in there? People like me, the blunt, straightforward, the blunt, straightforward Christian. You reckon any blunt, straightforward, say things and then think about it later and go, ooh, that might have been so nice, right? You think those people were in there? Do you think anybody in Acts 2 was hard to live with in the church? <laughs> so don't get this crazy. I've heard that said before, and that is just absolute tripe and garbage right there. This is not Christian wonderland, Okay. The church in Acts 2 is not Christian Disneyland or something like, 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 like large rodents all dressed up in princesses and whatnot are not running around. This is not Christian Disneyland, okay? They have all the same problems. I'm going to go one further. They got more problems than us because they don't have a supercomputer on their phone. And they don't have a car that, that blows cold air and, and a nice comfortable seat to sit on. They, they don't have all that garbage. They have like real problems. It's the first century. They, they have real problems, like, like, like where do I plug my phone up at? It's like a real problem in the first century because they don't got a phone and they don't got nowhere to plug it. You see what I'm saying? They got real problems. They, when they say I'm hungry, they're really hungry. When they say I'm destitute, it's like I'm really destitute, right? So they have real problems, and yet real problems, real attitudes somehow love the church anyway. Hmm. You cannot genuinely love Jesus and hate his body at the same time. Now, when I say hate his body at the same time, sometimes I, I, I may have a little flicker of, ooh, I didn't like that. I hate when that happens, right? But when the dust settles, you can't hate the body of Christ. Take it from a guy who's been planting a church with another guy for 18 years, Daniel, 19 years, many years, right? The ups and the downs and the social and the this and the oh, my God, and the oh, goodness, and, and the yay followed by the whoa. The whole sign, is a sign curve? Where's Juliet? The whole sign curve of, 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 of planting a church over a two-decade period. It is easy to be distressed by the church. It is easy to have your feelings hurt by the church. It is easy to be crushed by the church. It is easy to feel like this is all for nothing. It is easy to feel like you labor in vain. But I'm telling you, when the dust settles on the heart of a true believer in Jesus Christ, they always come back to, I love the church. They always do, okay? Also notice, there is another result of walking in the light. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, in my opinion, John should have led with that, right? Lead with that. That makes me feel better. That's a logical progression, John. Who told you to flip the script like that? But evidently, he was emphasizing fellowship, right? In any case, he does finally make Thomas happy, and he says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So that's another way of saying, oh, by the way, they're saved. Okay? First, this statement is evidence that walking in the light should never be confused with a sinless life, though. He's not just, see, that's why he messed the order up. That's why he didn't just say, yeah, they're saved and moved on. Listen how he says they're saved. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If you're getting cleansed from sin, what must still be in your life? Oh, logic train just pulled into the station, right? This statement is evidence that walking in the light should never be confused with, well, you led a sinless life, because that ain't going to happen on this side of heaven. Next week, we're going to see that even after salvation, sin is a reality of the Christian life. And everybody who was surprised by that, wave your hand up in there right now. Sin is still a reality after the Christian life begins, right? But the sins of the genuine Christian, per what we just read, they're forgiven. They're forgiven past sins. They're forgiven present sins. Because you're going to have, guess what? As a believer, you're going to have present sins. And uh, don't get it twisted. Coming around the corner in the near future, coming to a future near you, sin, 
right? And as they experience the ongoing, continuous reality that I'm a sinner, they're also, because they're actually saved, going to experience the ongoing, continuous reality that their sins are being cleansed by that atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, okay? So if I'm a genuine, here's the two that we've learned today. If I'm a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, then my life is going to resemble some, a life that pursues righteousness, right? And if I genuinely am saved and I genuinely love Jesus Christ, then I'm going to love his body. I'm going to love his church. And we're going to do more next week. So I'm going to let TJ or some fine, young, strong person grab that and move it. I've been stumbling with that thing for, for months, and I didn't realize I could just make my son stumble. I like it. So now, we've been talking about, does my life bear the evidence of salvation? How about this? Let's go one step further. How about let's just share how you can have a life that's saved? How can you have salvation in the first place? Right? What is this gospel of Jesus Christ? God's word says, first and foremost, that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. Who's all? Everyone. Who's all? Church people. Who's all? People in the south. People in the north. People in other countries. People in other continents. Who is all? All is all. Right? All have sinned. Past all. Future all. Present all. All all. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. We were made to love God. That love of God was supposed to result in obedience to his command. But we fall short of that. Therefore, we don't glorify him with this obedience. We don't glorify him with this love because we're falling short of this purpose we were made for. That's everybody. So we all have this sin issue, this sin reality. We have to realize that. Then we have to accept there's a consequence. Because I'm a sinner, there's a consequence. The wages of my sin is death. A wage is what I earn when I go to work. Well, a wage is also what you earn when you sin. What do I earn as a sinner? I earn death. And then there's this place called hell. And that's the second death. So I'm earning death physically, spiritually, but I'm also earning death eternal, separation from God forevermore, right? So after I accept there's a consequence, then I have to understand that I can't fix it on my own. I can do nothing to fix it on my own. Our passage tonight is not a contradiction to that. Our passage tonight does not say, hey, professing Christian, you're actually lost. Now go fix that. It does not say that. We cannot fix our sin problem. We have to understand that we are saved from this sin problem, this consequence of sin. We're saved by grace. That's a free gift, and we receive it through faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? Faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by our good works. It's not by our good deeds. It's not by our philanthropy. It's not by our good intentions. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's not by works. What is it? It is God's gift to me. And I'll never be able to boast about what I did because it's all about what Jesus did, right? So once I understand that, then I have to break down, well, what is faith? If I have to receive the salvation of God with faith, what is faith? Faith in God's word is belief in action. I believe what he tells me about his son. I believe what he tells me about the actions and the work of his son. And it actively transforms me. It changes me. It makes me act different. It makes me into a different person. It gives me a different nature right? I have this faith and it actively transforms me. First, I believe that God loves me. You have to believe first and foremost that God loves you. How do I know God loves me? How can I prove in my heart that God loves me? Well, he loved me enough to sacrifice his own son. John 3, 16, for God so loved this this world and we're the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if you'll just believe in him, You won't perish. You won't have the wages of sin, but you'll have everlasting life. So in order to give me everlasting life, in order to give me the forgiveness of sins, in order to give me a home in his heaven, he sacrificed what was most precious to him, his only begotten son, right? So once I believe that, then I have to believe, well, Jesus, he's not just a way to heaven. He's not just one one alternative that I can go with today. He's not just one to be considered among many, right? Jesus is this exclusive way to heaven. His words, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words. He's the only name under heaven by which a man can be saved. Jesus declares, I'm it. 
I'm the open door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who saves, right? Jesus is the exclusive path to heaven. I have to believe that. Then I have to believe the how of salvation. The how is Christ in innocence, in purity, free from any sin, free from any guilt. Christ died for my sins, all according to the scriptures, all according to the plan of God. Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. And then he was buried because that's what you do with dead people. You bury them because he was actually dead. He paid the price of death completely. And then he rose again on the third day, again, all according to the scriptures, all according to the plan of God. The wages of my sin was death. Jesus paid the wages of my sin. He paid the sacrifice. He paid the ransom for my freedom, right? And then I have to believe, well, how is it that Jesus is able to be this expression of God's love? How is he able to? to be the exclusive path to heaven? How is he able to be so perfect, so precious, so spotless, such a costly sacrifice that his death alone could atone for the sins of all sinners, past, present, and future? How is it that his death can be so costly? Well, the reason it's so costly is because he was and he is and he always will be God. God died on a cross that we might live. God the Son was sacrificed on a cross that we might live. He rose from the dead on the third day, proving himself to be God, proving himself to be a worthy object of saving faith, right? The reason he was able to do all that is because he's God, he was God, and he always will be God. Now, believing these things just as a matter of information in my head is different than what saving faith is. Saving faith happens on the level of the heart. Not the beating muscle in your chest. This is not a biology lesson. I'm talking about the actual inside of a person, the the core of who a person is, the desires and the motivations and the the things that I truly believe on the inside, the the belief that I have on the inside that nobody other than God can see. Just me and God know what's in here, right? That's where belief happens, and that begins with repentance. Repentance in God's word is just a turn, a 180-degree turn. I turn away from my sin and myself. And my definition of righteousness and my desires, I turn away from that inside my heart and I turn towards Jesus Christ. It's a change of worldview, a change of perspective, a change of of mindset, right? I turn away from sin and self and I turn towards Jesus Christ and I just beg him. I say, you fix me. I can't forgive myself. You forgive me. I can't redeem myself. You free me from the slavery to sin and self. I can't give myself a home in heaven. I am not a a worthy citizen of your heaven. But you can make me an heir of what is yours, an heir of the kingdom of heaven, a co-heir with you. So repentance is I turn my back on sin and self, and I turn towards Jesus Christ, and I give up. It's not a work. It's nothing I accomplish. It's a quit. It's a surrender. It's a white flag in there that says, I can't, Jesus, but you can. You can. So please, Lord Jesus, You saved me. And then I confess with my mouth that you're my Lord. And I believe in my heart that the Father raised you from the dead, proving that you're a worthy object of my faith. And your word says, Lord Jesus, I will be saved. So has that happened to you? Do you know? How does your life compare to these characteristics of a genuine believer that John is giving us? How does your life compare? Now, I'm not asking you, This next statement is not a statement of, are you perfect? This next statement is not a statement of, do you mess up? This next statement is not a statement of, well, well, how often do you mess up? That's not what I'm asking. I'm going to ask it in the most straightforward, drastic terms I can. Do you desire righteousness at all? Do you long for God's word at all? Do you desire to follow Jesus at all? Is that a priority in your life at all? If your answer to all those questions is a resounding no, and you don't have to say it out loud, ask yourself on the inside, am I answering those questions with a no? Like if I'm honest, are the answers to those questions no? If that's the answer, then the answer I'm providing you is you need Jesus as your Savior. You need Jesus as your Savior. But if you compare your life to these these characteristics of a genuine believer in this passage, And you do pursue righteousness. And you do have a love for the church. And you do desire his word. 
and you do long for it, well, then you have evidence that your salvation is real. And if that's the case, then when we pray in just a second, ask Jesus this question. Well, I've taken your test, and I'm convinced I belong to you. So now, Jesus, what next? What next? I mean, it's not just about belonging to you. It's not just about getting snatched from hell. It's not just about being saved. Obviously, there's more to it than that. Jesus, what's next? So y'all pray with me now. First and foremost, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've become convinced today that you don't know Jesus Christ, you can pray this prayer right now, and you can have a home in the same heaven that I have, the same heaven that our Savior Jesus Christ has created for us. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Your word declares it. My life is evidence of it. The wages of my sin is death. I deserve to die. I deserve to spend an eternity separated from you in hell. And I can't do anything on my own to fix it. But you, Lord Jesus, you loved me so much that you died for me to make me whole. You loved me so much that you became the exclusive path to a home in heaven. You sacrificed yourself and died in my place that I might live, that the wages of my sin might be paid in full. And the reason you were able to do it and the reason you desired to do it and the reason you were capable of pulling it off is because you are, always was, and always will be God. I believe with all my heart what your word says about you. I believe with all my heart what your word says about what you did for a sinner like me. I don't want my way anymore. I turn away from it. I turn towards you and I surrender. Save me. Forgive me. Atone for my sins. Rescue me from the consequences that I so rightly deserve. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. You are my Lord. I confess it with my mouth. I believe to the depth of my heart that the Father raised you from the dead. Save me. And if you prayed that prayer, follow it up with this. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me a home in your heaven. And then if you have passed the test today, and you know that you know that you know with certainty that you have a home in heaven, pray this simple prayer. One sentence prayer with me right now. What next? What now? Lord Jesus, it's got to be more than just me. It's got to be more than just what I want. It's got to be more than just what makes me happy. What's next? Inspire me, Lord Jesus, to serve you. Inspire me to be what you would have me be. Inspire me to reign your love through me on this fellowship of believers. I beg it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Opportunity. I'm grateful that you have allowed us to, to be here. So, Father, I, I pray that we would uh, we would take advantage of being in your presence, of being called together as a body of believers, as a family in Christ, and that we would um, just spend the next little while focused on you, on who you are. That we would set aside the the stress of what is coming, the, the stress of what has been. And we would just uh, just rest in your presence. And we would uh, hear your word taught as you've given it to Thomas, as you've led him to prepare for this week. I, I pray that you would 
just uh, open our hearts to hear what is being taught and then, Father, to have the courage to apply it to our lives. It's sometimes hard to hear your word taught, uh, but but we know that, that we're here for a purpose. We're here to uh, to hear it taught and, and to then apply it to our lives. And so, Father, we, we just we ask that you would open us up to, to do that, to be uh, to be a part of that. Father, let us let us be here in, in your presence so that when we leave, we can be refreshed and renewed. Father, just uh, be with Thomas as he speaks. I pray that you would bless his preparation. I pray that you would be with us to hear it. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys for singing with us. And now, does my life bear the evidence of salvation part two? Take three. All right, we're looking at 1 John 1, 5 through 10 for the second time. I'm just going to push through. There's, there's no way to make an edit break, so you're just going to you're just gonna have to make do. All right, so we're looking at 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Does my life bear the evidence of salvation? We've got one more characteristic of, of the saved life that we're going to look at today. But before we do that, let's recap. The Apostle John wrote this letter. That's what it is. It's an epistle. That means it's a letter that was written to a group of people. And it was intended to be copied and intended to be circulated and intended for you and I in 2023 to use it and apply it to our lives, right? So he originally wrote this letter to Christians that were living in Ephesus, Asia, and Asia Minor. These churches most likely received it, copied it, circulated it, and that's why we have it right now. At this time in history, at the time that it's written, first century, false teachers presented a huge problem for the early church. Christianity is a new thing, relatively new, right? I mean, we realize Christianity is just the actual reality of what's always been. However, to them, it's a new thing, right? It's gaining popularity. It's getting some, some, some momentum, right? And when anything gets popular, when anything gets momentum, then the false teachers attach themselves to it. So they had infiltrated the local churches, and they were promoting various heretical doctrines. Now, all of these would-be teachers had one thing in common. They preached a false version of the gospel. Unfortunately, not unlike today... Many in the early church were believing the heresy. They were believing the false teachers. They were believing the false gospel. And unfortunately, they were trying to share the false gospel, right? So again, we're going to employ a little common sense, right? False teachers rise to power in the Christian church. It's not going to be long before two tragedies occur. Always happens, right? People in the congregation, they become convinced that a different gospel is true. A different one that they heard. A different one than, than the Apostle John shared with them. A different one than they put their faith in, right? So then what do they do? They start sharing this gospel, this fake gospel, this false gospel in their community. When they start sharing this false gospel in their community, the church soon becomes filled with people who never genuinely place faith in Christ. Because a false gospel equals hell. It doesn't equal salvation. It doesn't equal a home in heaven. It doesn't equal forgiveness of sins. It equals the opposite of that. It equals condemnation. Right? So false gospel from false teachers rising in prominence, people believing that false gospel, people sharing that false gospel, the church becomes filled with people who don't have a genuine relationship with Jesus. Hmm, sounds like 2023, right? So for this reason, a large percentage of 1 John, the entire letter, is concerned with correcting false doctrines. Not just correcting them, but providing the church with different ways to test, is your faith genuine? So he, he, one part, he's correcting false doctrines, and another part, he's going, did you believe that false doctrine? Well, here's how you know if you actually believe the real gospel. Your life will look like X, Y, Z, over and over and over again. So he provides this early church and, and our church today with several ways to determine, am I saved or am I lost? But John wasn't the only person in the New Testament who believed that some church folks were actually lost. Another very famous guy who walked the earth in the first century, he said this, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name. Do many miracles in your name. And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. This is Jesus talking. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. 
So it's not just John. It's not just the Apostle Paul. It's not just these meddling apostles that are trying to stir things up. Jesus himself believed that sometimes church folk aren't saved. So with all this in mind, last Sunday I asked each of us to begin asking ourselves a question. Does my personal life, me Thomas, me fill in the name, right? Does my life bear the evidence of salvation? We have a bear now. We should have had a bear last week. I blame Krista. Does my life bear the evidence of salvation? Okay. In order to answer this important question, we have to know that what genuine Christianity looks like. I can't answer this question if I don't know, well, what does the actual victorious Christian life look like? Right? Only when I know what it looks like, only when I know what God says it looks like, only then can I compare my life with it, right? I have to know what it looks like, and then I have to take my life and compare it to the genuine to see if I'm fake or am I real, okay? So we started looking at three characteristics of the genuine Christian life last week. Let's read the whole passage one more time. 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Now this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not, part- and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So last week we learned first that genuine believers pursue righteousness. We don't always get there. We're going to find that out in our sermon today. But we pursue righteousness. John's argument in our passage goes a little like this. John says, God is light. There's no darkness in him. In other words, he is moral perfection. He doesn't sin. Therefore, God hates sin. And there's no possibility that God will ever commit sin. If we are truly saved, our lives will be characterized by obedience to the God who, oh yeah, is light. Now that does not mean we won't sin, but it does mean that we will pursue the light. Light represents righteousness in Scripture. So we are going to pursue righteousness. We're going to pursue this righteous, obedient life because we belong to the one who is light. Okay, if our lives are completely characterized by disobedience to God, if our lives are completely characterized by darkness, if we desire the darkness, if we run to the darkness if we walk around in the darkness, if we feel more comfortable in the darkness, then we're lost per John. Why? Because genuine believers pursue righteousness. Second thing we learned last week, genuine believers love the body of Christ. In our focal passage, John said it this way. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light, in other words, if we belong to God and we live in like we belong to God, then the result is going to be we have fellowship with one another. The natural result of a genuine love relationship with Christ is a love relationship with the body of Christ. If I'm in love with the head, of Christ, the head of the church, if I'm in love with my Savior, if I have this genuine fellowship with Him, then there's no way around it. I'm going to have a love relationship. Sometimes it feels like hate, but it's love. I'm going to have a love relationship with His church, with His body, right? There's just no way around it. To love Him is to love His church. A person cannot honestly say, well, I love Jesus, while at the same time despising His body. That's backwards. It's contrary. It's conflicting. It's contradictory. All the other ways I can say that, right? Fellowship with other believers is the direct result of fellowship with God. I'm going to have fellowship with other believers if I have fellowship with God. We're on a porch yesterday. We're sharing Jesus through the neighborhood. We started out having a conversation with the guys. I think it was the last conversation we had. Last one, right? 
So the last conversation we have, we're getting ready to we're gonna wrap it up because it's 105 degrees and I'm stumbling up and down these hills, right? So we're getting ready to wrap this thing up. I'm having this conversation. And, and at first the guy's like, yeah, he's giving us a, a, like a very polite version of, yeah, I'm okay. We're good. I'm affiliated. I got my uh, Christian. Got my little pen on my shirt. I'm good. I got like a fish on my car. I'm good. Got a little thing in the front yard. I'm, uh, I'm a Christian, right? We start having a little dialogue back and forth. Very casual. Nothing heavy. Nothing, you know, nothing weighty of any way. And then we start talking about, well, how can we pray for you? Take off my hat, say a little prayer. I thought it was, you know, I don't know if y'all have noticed it over the years, but, but as my Parkinson's has become more pronounced, I stumble on my words. I, I stammer sometimes. And during this prayer, I stammered. Standing on steps instead of on the ground because the steps are really tall and they wrap around. And so I'm kind of leaned on the little edge there and I'm kind of balancing like this and I'm got mumble mouth while I'm trying to pray. So I thought it was kind of uneventful. But evidently somewhere in there he went, oh, this guy knows Jesus. And then in his brain he goes, oh, this guy knows Jesus. I love him. And then there became a connection. And then we start talking. Right? And then all of a sudden he's snatching me up the stairs and, and giving me a hug. Let me know he's appreciating me. Letting me know he's praying for me. You see what I'm saying? Because if he, sorry, I'm drinking coffee because I don't want to be a baby right now. But see, it fights babyism too, not just Parkinson's, right? <laughs> Point number three, drink more coffee. No. Um, so he has a real, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. He recognizes in me a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And his natural response to that, his common sense response to that, I say his biblical response to that is, oh, I love this guy. Come on, bring it in, give me a hug, right? Like, like, he, like that's his response, right? When you have a love relationship with Jesus, the response is going to be a love relationship for the church. And that's a supernatural thing, by the way. I'm not saying that's a easy thing. I'm not saying it's a, a human natural thing because human nature is like, get away. Like, my human nature is I don't like you, go away, right? That's my human nature. Like, I want to live on the side of a mountain by a lake. I'll let you know when I want to talk. You know, one of those kind of things. That, that's, that's, I'll send a carrier pigeon to you two weeks from now. Well, I mean, that's our nature. That's our human nature, right? Or I would say my sinful nature, right, is to be away from people. But loving the church is a supernatural thing. That's why it's a, a characteristic of being saved, because now inside this saved person, I have this, I don't know, powerful God, the Holy Spirit, living inside of me, giving me compassion, giving me mercy, giving me forgiveness, giving me fidelity, giving me a love for somebody that, let's face it, we've all been in church. I mean, even in a little church like ours, like, right? Like sometimes, I, this is, you want to write this down if this is your first time hearing this, we ain't always lovely, right? We ain't always loving, we ain't always like the like 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 if you think about our 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 individualities here in this church, our individual characters and personalities in this church, we're not always first on the list for somebody to hang out with, right? And guess what? We're no different than every church on planet Earth. That's why this love relationship that I have with the church has to be supernatural. It has to be more than me. It has to be something that God's doing, not something that I do. All right, new material. Today we're going to learn one more characteristic, just one more. We're going to learn little parts of that. But we're going to learn one more characteristic of the genuine Christian life. And this is the one that um, the church really struggles with this one. But really, Thomas, I thought the church struggled to love each other. Well, they struggle with that too. But the genuine believer acknowledges their own sin. A genuine believer will acknowledge their sin. Genuine believers, they recognize, acknowledge, own, accept Put whatever word in that little blank makes you feel good. They own their own sin crap. That's what it comes down to. We own it. We own it because we understand it's there, right? Look at John 1, 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So this entire section of our passage today deals with the fact that genuine believers, guess what? We're sinners. 
Did you know that? This is a big box of sinners right here. Genuine believers are still sinners. John might say it this way. If you can't acknowledge to God and to yourself that, no, you're really not a good person. Like, you're not. Like, run that up the flagpole one time. Like, they put a little flagpole in the front yard and, and just, just fly this, this white flag with black letters. Not a good person. That's us. If you can't acknowledge that you're not a good person, then chances are John says you're lost. If you can't acknowledge that you're not good, that you're not all the time righteous, that you don't do it right all the time, in fact, that, that more often than not, you're going to be corrupted by sin. If you can't acknowledge that, then you're probably lost. So says John through the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So let's break that down a little bit. Three little facets of this. Number one, genuine faith, like, like saving faith, it begins when we recognize our sinfulness. Think about it. Step one to you placing faith in Jesus Christ. Step one to you having a home in heaven. Step one to belonging to the body, to have being a co-heir with Jesus, being a son of God, all those glorious, victorious, overcoming titles in the scripture, right? Step one to all of that is what we have to do. We have to realize that all have sinned and fall short. It's almost like that's why our gospel presentation has like a first step. Faith begins when you recognize your sinfulness. Okay? John, uh, 1 John 1 10 says, If we say we don't have any sin, more literally from the Greek, it says, If we say we have never sinned. That's an important distinction to make. We're going to talk about the other kind in just a second. But more literally, it says, If we say we have never sinned. Okay? Some of the false teachers that were infiltrating the church at this time all across Asia and Asia Minor, they were claiming, well, you know what? You can listen to me because I'm perfect. You can listen to me because I don't sin. You can listen to me because I've never sinned, right? If we say we have never sinned, John says we make him, that's Jesus, a liar. Now, in Romans 3, the Apostle Paul strung together many quotations and concepts that are found all throughout the Old Testament scriptures, especially in the prophets, right? And when he does this in Romans 3, Paul, not John, is, is, is expressing the fact that mankind is universally sinful. Universal sinfulness is a characteristic of all humanity, right? Look at Romans 3, 9 through 23. You've heard bits and pieces of this. You've heard me paraphrase this. Let's read it all out, all, all in a row. Romans 3, 9 through 23, Paul writing to the church in Rome. Paul says, what then? Are we, he's talking about the Jews, are we any better? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles, by the way, when somebody in the Bible says Jews and Gentiles, he says everybody on earth. Okay? Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. As it is written. All right, when he says as it is written, what just happened? Paul's getting ready to quote something from the OT, right? He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. The opposite of repentance, right? Repentance is turning towards God. Turning away is being sinful, right? All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good. Well, what about me, though? Well, you know, Paul says not even one, right? Their throat is an empty, is an open grave. Ooh, it's getting worse. They deceive with their tongues. It's, it's getting more, more and more, right? Viper's venom is under their lips. Now Paul's just being mean, right? Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Oh, he followed me home. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, and now we know that whatever the law says speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. Listen to this next part. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed. Attested by the law and the prophets. That's the way I say in the Old Testament. That is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe 
since there is no distinction. For all have sinned, this should sound familiar, and fall short of the glory of God. Did you know when I quote that at the end of every sermon, did you know that I was summarizing all of that, viper's venom and whatnot, just all of that, not seeking, not understanding, not good, not even one, no, not one. By the way, no, not one, right? That's humanity in our own power, humanity in our own steam, humanity doing it our way, doing what comes natural to us, doing what we have the capacity to do. That's why being declared righteous is a God thing. Being forgiven is a God thing. Being changed is a God thing. Being not unrighteous is a God thing. Performing a work that is good is a God thing. See what I'm saying? So the point here is that God declares repeatedly in his word that all of mankind is sinful. That's why Jesus had to dawn a cross in the first place. That's why we needed a sacrifice. That's why somebody had to take our punishment. Because apart from Jesus coming in to rescue us, we get what we deserve. Condemnation. The only man to ever lead a sinless life was Jesus Christ. If a person other than Jesus ever declares, I never sinned. Sin was never an issue in my life. Here's how I've heard it before. When I've shared the gospel with somebody, sometimes I've heard, well, you know. I just kind of knew I was always all right. I knew I was, uh, me and God were always good. That's how we kind of say it nowadays, right? If they say something like that, then they are actually calling God a liar. Thomas, how mean? No, John, how mean? Right? John said that. And then he goes one step further because that's not mean enough, right? He says, and his word is not in us. So if we say, I've never sinned, we're not just deceiving ourselves. We're not just calling Jesus a liar, but we are lost. You following the, the little bouncing ball there? So obviously, if we declare that we have never sinned, then we don't accept the truth of God's word, right? If I don't accept that God only tells the truth, then it is highly unlikely that I'm going to accept the truth of his gospel, right? In other words, to believe I've never sinned is evidence that I'm lost. Okay, application time. Salvation requires that we completely acknowledge the reality of our situation, right? The Holy Spirit has to move. God, the Holy Spirit, has to draw. I got to be given eyes so that I can see the reality of my situation. I have to have ears given to me so that I can hear the truth. I have to have comprehension given to me so that I can see the desperate situation that I'm in. Salvation requires me to completely acknowledge the reality of my situation, the reality that Thomas Vaughn is a sinner. Repeatedly, Jesus declared the need for repentance. Luke 13, 2 through 5, this one should sound familiar too, right? And he responded to them, that's Jesus. Do you think these Galileans were more sinful than all Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you, Jesus' words, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Are those 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on and killed, do you think they were more sinful than all the people who live in Jerusalem? No, he says, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Well, I mean, that's just an isolated statement made by Jesus, right? He would never, oh, wait a minute, Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? His sermon sounded like this. Hey, I'm Jesus. I'm the son of God. I came to die on the cross, but you're all right. I mean, I mean, not for you. You're good. You're good. Everybody else is bad, but you're good. No, what did he say? He said, repent. Over and over again, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. He says, the kingdom of heaven is in your face. It's decision time. Time to turn or burn. Jesus' sermon, not mine, right? Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance in Scripture is a turn. Salvation begins begins when we realize that we're sinners, and then we turn away from our sin and ourself, and we turn towards Jesus Christ, right? Therefore, I submit to you today that it is impossible to turn away from something that you have not acknowledged in your life. It is impossible to be saved from something that you did not know was condemning you. It is impossible to be forgiven for something that you have no clue you did. Jesus 
first has to give you the capacity to realize your sinfulness. And then you, with this capacity, have to acknowledge it, own it, bask in it for a second. Let the reality of it wash over you. If you never acknowledge that you are a sinner, then you're lost. To be saved, you have to first realize you're lost. You have to realize that you need saving. You can't be delivered from condemnation if you didn't understand. You can't trust in the atoning death of Jesus Christ if you never understood that your sin put him on that cross in the first place. Right? One of the most tragic things that ever happened to the church is the belief that we can no longer talk about sin and repentance in hell. Think about how tragic that is. I've just laid out for you that the beginning of faith is to recognize I'm a sinner. The beginning of a genuine faith relationship with Jesus Christ is I recognize I'm a sinner. How backwards is it that the church of Jesus Christ for the past 40 years has decided that even though salvation begins with recognition, I can't talk about what I have to recognize. I can't talk about the need to turn away from what I recognize. I can't talk about the consequence of what I need to recognize. How backwards is that? What good does it do to talk about the love and the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ if that love and grace and mercy isn't applied to, I don't know, a sinner? Right? Now, maybe on the surface that sounds like a good idea. Well, I mean, it's good church growth, right? That's a question we were asked uh, on, on in the neighborhood yesterday. We were asked, hey, uh, how successful is this uh, walking through the neighborhood? Sharing? I mean, are you growing? Is this like, like a way to get people in church? And my response was, nope. <laughs> but it sure is a way to minister to people, right? It's a way to minister to their salvation need. It's a way to minister to their regular needs. It's a way to find out they have a need. We haven't blown the church up by visiting people over the years, but we sure do minister to people, right? Sometimes, like yesterday, they ministered to us, right? I mean, a lot of churches are like, well, I'm just going to emphasize the grace and love of God, but I'm just going to bypass the holiness and the justice and the righteous indignation. But my question for us today is, who gave us the right to tell half the story? I guess a serious question. Who gave you and I the right to tell half of God's story or half of the good news? Who, who gave us the right? Think about it for a second. How did Jesus share his gospel, right? Did Jesus walk up to you and go, I'm just love? No, there won't be a second coming. No, no white horse. No, no, no judgment, no condemnation. Is that how he did it? No. Jesus spoke about hell more than any of the other apostles, right? Jesus learned how often... I mean, we learned how often he emphasized our sin and our need for repentance just a couple pages back in this manuscript, right? I quoted it to you from Luke. I quoted it to you from Matthew, and that's just a couple. So my question is, if Jesus spoke about hell all the time, if Jesus talked about repentance all the time, then why do we get to alter his story? And how can a person even begin to understand the love of God if we don't understand first that we did nothing to deserve the love of God. How do I understand even remotely this all-powering, unconditional love that was acted upon by God on my behalf? How do I even begin to remotely fathom that? If I don't first understand, oh, yeah, and by the way, he poured this love out on me when I didn't deserve it. Because why? Because I was a sinner, right? So hopefully this is going to sound obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. We can't preach half the gospel, guys, because the person who only believes in half the gospel will spend their entire eternity in hell. Half the gospel equals a whole amount of eternity spent in hell, right? So I'm going to ask each and every person listening to this sermon, either today in this room or sometime in the future as we, as we post a video, I'm going to ask you this question. When you asked Jesus to be your Savior, did you understand that he would save you from the consequences of your own sin? Did you understand there was a sin problem? Did you understand I'm being saved from something? He's my Savior because he's saving me from something. 
If the answer to that question is no, then I promise you that at the end of this sermon, I'm going to do something that is not unprecedented. It happens every week, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to share the other half of the gospel that you need to hear. I'm going to share the entire gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Letter B. This is going to be groundbreaking. You ready? Fill this in. Underline it. Circle it one time. Believers continue to sin after salvation. Did you know that? Believers continue to sin after salvation. I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm holified, sanctified, justified, righteousified. I'm all the ifieds. But guess what you also do? You're sinified because you're still going to sin. Okay? You're going to, you, to continue to sin after salvation. It's going to happen. 1 John 1.8. If we say, we, by the way, is the church. John's including himself in that. If we say we have no sin. Now, the verb here, to have, is in the present tense. That one in the, the one that I gave you the literal of in the past was in the perfect sense. This is the present tense. Okay? That means the idea that's being expressed is not one that has never sinned in the past. He's not talking about someone who's never sinned. Right? He's talking about somebody who says, I don't sin right now. Like, I'm not going to sin tomorrow. Like, I'm not going to keep sinning. Like, I'm not in the midst of sinning as we speak. Now, instead, the false teachers were also claiming that since professing faith in their gospel, they had stopped sinning completely. Not only did they claim, well, I've never sinned. The false teachers were claiming, not only have I never sinned, but now that I have placed faith in this, in this awful false gospel, guess what? I don't sin at all. I just walk around floating. Ricky Righteous, I'm Susie Spiritual, I just hover. I don't even touch the ground. Never sin. Clothes are always gleaming white for some reason. I don't know. I don't even have to wash them. They're just white. They're just beaming. Look at me, victorious. That's what I am. I'm just, I'm just a, a sinless person, right? Now, I don't want to speak for any of you, but if saved people no longer sin at all, then Thomas must be lost, right? If saved people don't sin at all, then you can follow me home and see the evidence of my lostness, okay? Fortunately for me and you, I think, John goes on to say, if we believe that, then we are doing something. We are deceiving ourselves. If we believe that we no longer sin, that we're never going to sin again while we're walking on this earth, we are deceiving ourselves. One of the smarties, and I use that tongue-in-cheek, one of the smarties that I came across in my study made a great comment on the issue. I said it. A smarty did something good. I said it, right? I'm going to paraphrase him, okay, because I had to fix him a little bit, but I'm going to paraphrase him. For a Christian to say, I have no sin, is only evidence of self-deception because those around us see all the sin and the hypocrisy in our lives. We may deceive ourselves, but nobody else is fooled into thinking that we don't sin. Boom, that's 2023 20, right there. We talk about how righteous we are. We talk about how good we are. We act a certain way. We condemn everybody else as if they're the only ones who mess up. But everybody sees the sin in our life. They see it. They just follow us around enough, right? They see the hypocrisy in our life. We're deceiving ourselves and thinking that we've arrived. But nobody else is fooled, right? And then John goes on to say, and the truth is not in us. In other words, not only is our claim to be sinless a self-deception, our belief that we are saved is also self-deception. If I am sitting here today and I think that I don't sin ever, I'm deceiving myself about my sin situation, and I'm deceiving myself that I even belong to God in the first place. Harsh words, but, but true, right? Because genuine believers acknowledge their own sin. Genuine believers acknowledge their own sin. And here's the kicker, especially after salvation. Especially after salvation. After salvation, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. After salvation, the Holy Spirit is constantly convicting me. Nope, did that wrong. Nope, did that wrong. Have you been in God's Word? Because if you, if you had been in God's Word, you'd know, well, you did that wrong too. Because God lives inside of me. So when I fall short, when I mess up, when I know I'm wrong, when I'm doing it wrong... I have this glaring testimony of the Holy Spirit saying, by the way, not in the Spirit right now. Kind of walk by the flesh right now. Kind of being sinful right now. Right? Genuine believers have no choice with that testimony of God inside of us to acknowledge our own sinfulness. 
especially after we're saved, because then God is testifying to us, right? So let's apply this. Even though we have been made into new creations, new creatures in Christ, on this side of heaven, we are always going to be sinners. This is an inescapable fact. It is inescapable. That does not mean that we're not culpable or responsible for our sins. But the fact is, on this side of heaven, we will sin. Okay? And therefore, it is crucial that the church help new converts especially. New converts especially need to understand this reality that on this side of heaven, we are going to sin. One of the most spiritually debilitating things that a new Christian can ever believe is that saved people don't sin anymore. Think about that for a second. I just get saved last week. Maybe no one even tells me. Maybe I never even hear the words that saved people don't sin. Maybe I don't hear that, that false gospel. Maybe I don't hear that. But it is portrayed to me with the legalism of the church that I'm supposed to be sinless. It is portrayed to me by the church that if I do sin, I should never talk about it. I mean, don't tell, I mean, don't tell anybody because if I tell anybody, then they're going to know I sinned. Right? Don't tell anybody about it. Don't talk about it. You know, if it happens, look down your nose and scrrr with a finger like that, right? So we may not say that sinners are, and Christians are different, that, that Christians never sin after salvation. We may not preach that sermon, but we live that sermon in front of people. And that new, that new convert, well, he gets saved, and he's all hopped up on Diet Coke and Jolly Ranchers and Jesus, right? And he's all on fire, and then all of a sudden, tomorrow comes. Whoops! Did I just do that? Wait a minute, I thought I was saved. Maybe I'm lost. See what I'm saying? This false belief that saved people don't sin anymore can produce a variety of joy-stealing misconceptions. The new believer, he may start off doing well, but like I just said, eventually that spiritual high is going to wear off, and they're going to commit not just a sin, but it's going to be a glaring, undeniable, nope, can't, can't wiggle my way out. Yep, I just sinned, right? They're going to have one of those kind of sins. And what do you think happens next? Some are going to do that, and they're immediately going to doubt their salvation like I just talked about. That's a real thing. How many times do I hear a story when I'm sharing Jesus with somebody, and they talk about, well, you know, I've been baptized like nine times. <laughs> Why did you get baptized nine times? Well, I got saved, and I got baptized. And then I watched a bad movie, and then I got saved. And then I got baptized, and then I said a cuss word, and then I got saved. And then I got baptized. And then I didn't even think I needed it anymore, but then my mom, my mom, my mom saved me, and she baptized me forcibly. And, and you hear these, these, these testimonies over and over again. Because the person thinks, oh, well, goodness gracious, I'm somehow not saved. Others become convinced of the next logical step. Not only are they not saved because they're sinners, but their salvation must have been real, and somehow I lost it. Right? Wasn't just a matter of it was never real in the first place. Now it's a matter of, well, I sinned, I messed up, so I must have lost it. And then they spend all their time and all their energy and all their effort trying to be a good person so I can get it back, which is absolutely contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And then spiritual confusion mixed with Misapplication of scripture just abounds in that person's life. The victorious Christian life, the peace that passes understanding, the, the fruit of the spirit that's supposed to be, be exploding out of this new Christian gets stifled. And the Holy Spirit gets grieved. And misconception takes over. Misapplication takes over theological confusion takes over because somehow, some way, maybe not even with our words, maybe just with our actions, we have told this brand new Christian, hey, you're never going to mess up. I never mess up. You'll never mess up. It is crucial, guys, that we teach new converts that even after you get saved, you're going to continue to sin. That's why it's important to be forgiven past, present, and future. That's why it's important that his, his one-time death on the cross covers all the sin of humanity once and for all. It has to cover it. It has to cover it into the future because in the future we're still going to be sinners. Very important to, to teach that to a new believer. Okay? Let her see. Fellowship intimacy with God requires confession of sin. Fellowship intimacy with God requires confession of sin. 
So first, my faith begins when I acknowledge and recognize I'm a sinner, right? And then I need to understand as a saved person that I'm still going to be sinning every now and then. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now I have this fellowship intimacy problem with God because I still sin. But my fellowship intimacy with God can be restored through confession of sin. Look at the next verse, verse 9. John writes, if we confess, he just said, if you're, if you're saved, you're still going to sin. Summary, right? And now he says, if we confess our sins, he, God, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So after teaching us that true believers will continue to sin after salvation, John now comforts us with the fact that we can still maintain a good, proper fellowship intimacy with God. Even though I'm still going to mess up, even though I'm still going to rebel against him, even though I'm still going to do it wrong, even though I'm still going to grieve him, even though I'm still going to anger him, right? I have the capacity to confess and have my, my fellowship with him restored. So let's start out with what he says first. He says, if we confess our sins. The word confess right here from the original Greek meant to say the same thing. Did you know that's what confession is? Everybody thinks improperly. Well, they think a lot of improper things about confession. Let's talk about the first one. Thing number one. The first thing they think is confession is telling somebody something that was a secret. Krista, I want to confess something to you. I'm going to have another cup of coffee. Right? Like, like, I'm, tell, like I'm telling you something. Right. And what was her response? Yeah, I already knew that. When we confess our sin to God, you know what his response is? Yep, mm -hmm, knew that. We're not telling God something secret. We're not letting him in, we're not letting him in on the, the big news, okay? To confess literally means to say, that's what the, the little prefix homo there means, to say the same thing. I'm saying the same thing. I'm saying something like he's saying. He already is saying, well, you're a sinner. And I'm saying, oh, you know what? I agree with you, God. I am a sinner. It describes this act of agreeing with God. Confession is I just agree with God because God saw my heart. Well, first, God saw the future, and then God saw my heart, and then God saw me say it, or God saw me commit it, and then God saw the, 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 the garbage storm that followed after it, right? He saw all that already, and I thought it was over here in the dark where nobody could see, but actually I'm confessing to God, yeah, you already think this about this. You already know this is sin. When Thomas said that, that was sin. When Thomas did that, that was sin. When Thomas acted that way, it was sin. And you already know it, and now I'm agreeing with you, God. That's all confession is. To confess our sins to God, in a sense, is to drag them out into the open, not for God, for us. We drag our sins out into the open for us, and then we stand over where God's already at because he's already, he's already judged it. He's already... He's already discerned that it's sin. And now we drag it out into the open so that everyone, including us, can see it. And then we walk over and stand next to God and go, yep, that's sin. You, God, you are so right. That is sin. That's confession. Okay? He says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, please, it's very important. Don't miss this next part of the sermon. Very important. The context of this statement is the sin of a believer. If it's the sin of a believer, what's that believer already got in his life? Forgiveness. Salvatory forgiveness. Forgiveness that equals salvation in Jesus Christ. He already has that. Okay? Verse 8 uses a hypothetical to describe the evidence of being lost. That's verse 8. The hypothetical is, if a person does not acknowledge their sin, then they're lost. Right? Verse 9 uses a hypothetical to describe the counterpoint, the evidence of being saved, not lost. If a person does acknowledge their sin. See what I'm saying? So this is talking about the sin of a saved person. So how do I, I work that under my head. If I confess my sin, I'm going to be forgiven. But if I place faith in Jesus Christ, I'm already forgiven. What is going on there? I don't understand. Well, let me try to explain it to you. Our relationship with God 
contains two levels of intimacy. There are two levels of intimacy. And if you think about it, that kind of happens in every family. Okay? I'm going to use, I always use TJ for this. I'm going to use Hannah for this example now. Welcome, welcome to the illustration. You're welcome. Right? The first level of intimacy with God or within a family is relational. Relational intimacy or judicial forgiveness. That is established when we confess our sin and turn away from it and trust Jesus to save us. When that happens, we become a legally recognized son of God. Male and female, adult and child. If we turn away from sin and self and turn towards Jesus Christ with faith, we become a son of God. That means we are legally recognized. That means we are owned. God says we belong to him in public. We're no longer illegitimate. We belong to him. So he's legitimately our father, and we're legitimately his sons. You get it? Relational intimacy. Now, how does that apply to the Christian life? If I have relational intimacy with my daughter, I'm her father. She's my daughter. Now, y'all know how that works. If you're a parent, you know how that works. There is nothing that she can say or nothing that she can do or nothing that she can get convicted of or nothing that I'll, uh, that I'll ever have to like maybe help her hide the evidence of. Nothing that will ever happen in her life that will make her not my daughter. Always my daughter. Forever my daughter. To the point that it nauseates her sometimes. She's my daughter, right? She's mine. Relational intimacy will never change between us, okay? That's relational intimacy. Fellowship intimacy is maintained with God as legal sons when we go to God our Father and we confess our sins that we will continue to commit after salvation. When a believer confesses, they receive familial forgiveness. Now, fellowship intimacy, familial forgiveness, that's different. Let's go back to the the daughter-father illustration. Always my daughter. No matter what she does, no matter who she does it to, no matter how much time she gets to serve for it, right? Always my daughter, no matter what, no matter what, right? However, if she walks through the living room the wrong way with the wrong attitude and rolls her eyes the wrong way, then I mean her have a problem, right? She's still my daughter, right? Or it works the other way, too, between her and me. Like if I fly off the handle and I say the wrong thing, I'm always daddy, I'm always going to be daddy, but you know, at the present moment, Hannah don't want nothing to do with daddy. You know what, daddy? You could be daddy in another room because we have static between each other. Our intimacy has been interrupted. Our fellowship has a a little, little, uh, little not relationship altering, but we still have an issue. See what I'm saying? For that fellowship intimacy to be restored between daughter and father, somebody has to go, yep, I messed up. Sorry about that. I agree with you. That was wrong. Forgive me. And she's like, yeah, you're already forgiven. We're good. See what I'm saying? That's fellowship intimacy. So when you have a salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, when you have this salvation, you can't lose it. There's nothing that can be done to you, nothing that can be done by you, nothing that can be said by you that will ever snatch you away from being a son of God. Satan himself can't snatch you from being a son of God. Now, your relationship with God is forevermore forgiven. You forevermore have a home in heaven. You forevermore are his son, a son of God. But I can have unconfessed sin in my life, and my fellowship relationship with him makes me feel far away. Even though I'm the one that moved, he's right there, but I feel far away. Or I feel like I can't talk to him. Or I feel like, I, I, feel like I, I need to confess something, but I'm not willing to do it. I can have an interruption in this fellowship with God that causes there to be static between me and God. The way I deal with that static, the way I get this familial forgiveness that takes the static away from my relationship, that restores the intimacy to this joyous level, the way I do that is I confess my sin. If we confess our sins, by the way, that he says. Notice he says sins. He doesn't say the singular. He says plural. Must be a reason for that. That's not his usual way of speaking. Notice the plural is used here. You've got to emphasize that. The singular of sins, sin, is used to express general idea. 
If I want to talk about sin in general, I call it sin. See, I, I, even in English you do that, right? If I'm talking about sin in general, I'm just talking about, I talk about it in the singular, right? It speaks of the general idea, the, the essence of sin or the guilt that's associated with sin. But in the plural of the Greek, it speaks of the actual evil activities. The point that's being made here is it's not a bad idea. It's actually a good thing to confess my sins to God specifically. I mean, think about it. If I commit 45 sins today, which is, I mean, I didn't even ground record, but it's possible, right? Like, if I can commit 45 sins today, it's not a bad idea to go, yeah, yeah, God, I agree with you on that one, and I agree with you on that one, and I agree with you on that one. It's not a bad idea to do that. How do we normally do it? Oh, Lord, forgive me for all the various and sundry ways that I was a crappy person today. Forgive me for that. Got to go to the lake. All right, let me God mean it by Right? I mean, that's our normal confession. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who, who trespass against us. Amen. Right? I just combined two versions at the same. Y'all heard that, right? That was like, that was King James and NASB and, and a little bit at home and all rolled into one. Right? But we go like, yeah, forgive us. I mean, it was in the Lord's Prayer. Certainly I'm allowed to summarize, Right? Yeah, I'm being. I'm, I'm saving God some time. God's got other people to talk to. Everybody's sinning, right? The whole world is sinning. He's got other people to talk to, right? The point is, is that confession is dragging that sin out into the open and looking upon it with God and going where God's at. Not a bad thing to, to list out your sins. Now, that does not mean, well, if I forget one, whoops, I'm in trouble. What it does mean is you're trying your best to completely restore that, that, that intimacy with God, that fellowship intimacy. All right, let's do a little application. A genuine believer desires the fellowship intimacy of God. Genuine believers will never make this statement. Genuine believers won't go, well, I mean, I know I'm far from God. I'm okay with that. I mean, I know we had not talked in a while. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, I know I, I hadn't picked up a Bible in five years, but, you, I mean... Do I really need to? You see what I'm saying? Genuine believers are going to want to have a relationship. If I'm in a genuine, healthy relationship with my wife, I'm going to want to talk to her every now and then. Maybe be near her every now and then. Maybe I'm going to want there to be no static between us, right? Maybe I'm going to want to resolve issues. That's how it is in relationships between people. That's how it is in relationships with you and God, right? Therefore, if I'm a genuine believer, on a regular basis, I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to confess it. Especially after I read in 1 John, that that's how I can have things restored. Now God has revealed to me, I don't have to have my joy robbed. I don't have to have my peace robbed. I don't have to walk around feeling guilty all the time. I don't have to walk around feeling like I've fallen short. I can just go to God, and I can get the static taken away. I can restore this fellowship with Him. Right? Now... The important application, not that they're all not important, but this is a very important one. You ready? Let's talk about what this passage is not teaching us, okay? Because this is one of those passages that gets run up the flagpole by five different people with five different views, okay? This passage is not teaching us the following. It is not, N-O-T, not teaching us, well, if I, can, if I forget to confess one sin, like, I mean, oh, no, I forgot I said that on the highway today. Oh, in my heart, I wanted to run him right off the road. No, I forgot to say that. I forgot. Well, I guess I'm not forgiven now. That's not what this passage is saying. Sins is plural. That's not what this passage is saying. It's also not teaching us, well, I need to confess to God's official representative. Like I got to find, I got to find the right guy in the right church with the right credentials and the right diploma on the wall with the, the, the correct robe, right? Very hard to say right and white at the same time. With the right white robe on and a tassel and someone swinging some smoke and some doodads on the wall. i got to find that. If I find that guy with all, if I, all the right religious doodads, right? If I find all the doodads and the guy that's in the middle of all the doodads, if I just go find him and I go get in a box somewhere, now I can just I can tell him all about it and he'll tell God for me. Not in this passage. This is confession to the one that you have the static with. I don't have a static with doodad guy. I have static with God. 
Well, correction, I do have static with do to God, but that's different. Okay? <laughs> I have static with God. So I confess where I'm messing. I confess to God that I agree with him that I'm the cause of the static. See what I'm saying? Now, what is this passage teaching? Like, what is it teaching? It's teaching us that God is always faithful to his word. And he is righteous in all of his dealings with us, right? So because of the kind of God he is, faithful, righteous, the kind of God he is, truthful. Because of the kind of God he is, if I confess my sins to him, if I tell him I agree that that was wrong, then he will hold up his end of the deal that he has signed up for, and he will cleanse us, and he will restore our fellowship intimacy with him. It's that simple. I don't need an intermediary. I have one. His name's Jesus. I don't need another intermediary. I don't need an official church. Like, I can actually confess my sins outside of the strip mall, right? Like, I can confess my sins at the house somewhere where nobody can see. It's just me and God. I don't have to have help, right? I don't need help with that. So now let's do the big application of this entire passage. If you're sitting here today or if you're listening to this on, online later and you know that you're saved but you still feel far from God, then it is very possible that unconfessed, undealt with sin is hindering your fellowship and intimacy with God. If you know you're truly saved, if you've seen the evidence of salvation in your life, but for whatever reason, you're sitting there today and you're like, yep, I, just, I feel like there's a disconnect. I feel like I'm, I'm far from God. I feel like there's a problem. If that's you, it may be because of a very simple and curable ailment. There is unconfessed, undealt with sin in your life. Now, that does not mean call Daniel up. Go, Daniel, put your purple shirt on. I got some confessions to make. That does not mean that. It does not mean Thomas. Pull the, the same black shirt out the closet that you always pull. I don't know why it became a shirt thing. But you pull the same black shirt out and be official. If you put the black button up on, I can confess to you, right? No, that does not mean that. I don't know why. Very shirt. Anyway, my point is this. You can do business with God right where you are. At work, break room, school, house, bedroom, whatever, Right? That far away feeling, that, that something's not quite right feeling, that I have static in my fellowship feeling, can be easily dealt with. You just go, God, I agree. When I did that, that sucked. I'm sorry. That was so horrible. That was, that was so rebellious. Why did I do that? So sorry. And God's like, yeah, I'm faithful. Boom. I'm righteous. Boom. I, I keep my word. Now don't you feel like we're close again? See what I'm saying? But if you feel far from God and... Your life doesn't remotely resemble the characteristics of a saved person like that we've been talking about for two weeks, right? If you don't pursue righteousness, ever. If you don't have any love for the church, ever, right? Those kind of things. If my life doesn't remotely resemble the characteristic of a saved person in this passage, then you may desperately need to hear the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, and as my son moves this out of the way, let's share the gospel. I love having a roadie now. I may not fall out of this place ever. I love it. The gospel is very plain. It has like a starting point, though. You ever notice that? Like the gospel has a starting point. What might that starting point be? Oh, I have to realize that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. So the starting point of salvation is I have to realize I need to be saved. I have fallen short of what God created me for. Once I realize that, then I have to accept something. Uh-oh, there's a consequence for being a sinner. The wages of my sin is death. There's a place called hell, and that's the second death, right? Hell had a, a little chink in my hand there. There's a place called hell. It's the second death, right? There's a consequence for being a sinner. I have to accept that. Then I have to understand with all that I am that I can't fix it on my own. There is no such as I've never sinned. There is no such as I'm not going to sin again, right? I can't fix my sin problem on my own. I need supernatural help. I need divine help. I need the one that made me to help me, the one that I rebelled against to save me, right? God's word says that I am saved from the consequences of my sin. I am saved by grace. I did not earn it. It's a free gift. 
right? I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is how I receive this gracious gift of salvation. Faith is not just any kind of faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ, the only true object of my faith, right? And salvation is not by works. It's God's gift to me, and I'll never be able to boast about what I did to have a home in heaven. So if I receive the salvation of God with faith, I have to understand what faith is. Faith in God's word is belief in action, belief that changes, belief that is acted upon, belief that transforms. I believe what God's word tells me about his son. I believe what God's word tells me about what his son did for me, and I become a new something, right? I believe first and foremost that God, even though I sinned against him, even though I'm unlovely in his sight and unloving in his direction, even though all of that's true, my God in heaven loved me anyway. And he proved it because he loved me so much that he gave his only begotten son to me. And if I just believe in him, I won't perish. I won't suffer the wages of my sin, but I'll have everlasting life. I have to believe that. I have to believe that God loved me. I have to believe with all my heart that this Jesus that he sent to me, this expression of his love, Jesus Christ, that he sent to die in my place, he's not just a way to heaven, but he's the exclusive way to having a restored relationship with God. His words, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' words, John 14, 6, Jesus' words. Once I believe he's the exclusive way to heaven, then I have to understand the how. Well, how is that possible? Well, the Bible says that Christ died for my sins, according to the scriptures. And then he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. So he died for me, paying the penalty and the wages of my sin, taking on my punishment, and then he proved himself to be God the Son by rising from the dead on the third day, right? And that's the final thing I have to believe, the way he's able to be this perfect, precious, sinless sacrifice that dies in my place. The way he's able to be this perfect expression of God's divine love. The way he's able to be this exclusive path to a home in heaven. It's all because he was and he is and he always will be God. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that word he became flesh and he dwelt among us. Right? So once I believe these things, it has to be more than something in my head. It has to be something that changes me. It has to be something that affects me to the level of my heart. That requires repentance. Repentance is just a turn. I'm going this way, right towards the purple shirt. I'm going this way, right? And it's all about me, and it's all about my idea of righteousness. It's all about my understanding of being good. It's all about me be trying to be good on my own. It's about me not caring whether I'm good on my own. It's all me. And I turn inside my heart, inside my being. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from myself. I don't want that anymore. I'm not inclined to that anymore. I don't desire that anymore. And I turn away from sin and self. And I turn towards Jesus Christ. And I say, okay, I have completely and totally messed it up. I agree with you. I messed it up. You fix it. You deliver. You, you change. You redeem. You forgive. Because I can't do any of that. But you can. I confess with my mouth that you're my God. That you're my Lord. And I believe in my heart that the Father raised you from the dead. And the promise of all promises is if I do that, I'll be saved. Save me, Lord Jesus. That's the gospel. The whole gospel. From sin to salvation. The whole gospel. So my question for you today is, has that happened to you? Well, how do I know, Thomas? Well, take your life and lay it next to the characteristics of a saved person. If those characteristics in no way apply to you, it's a good, it's a good uh, indication that you don't know Jesus. But you don't have to be there forever. You can know him right now. Right. If you're here today or you're watching online later and you're at a point in your life where I don't know if I have a home in heaven and you want to have that home in heaven, it's so simple. You just open yourself up and you, with, with meaning in your heart, you pray a prayer like this. Lord in heaven, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I fall short of why you made me. And because of that, I deserve to be separated from you. Because of that, I deserve to die forevermore. I deserve it. And I understand I can't fix that. I can't right the wrongs, and I can't, I can't do right in my own power. I know I can't. But you love me so much, God, you sent me a way to your heaven. You love me so much, God, that you sent me the exclusive way to heaven, God the Son, Jesus Christ. I believe he's God. 
I believe he's the perfect gift of God. I believe he's the sinless God man. And I believe that he died on a cross to pay the penalty of my sin. I believe with all my heart that if I just place my faith in him, he'll save me. So I turn away from me. I don't want me anymore. I want to change my perspective completely. And I want to trust in you, Lord Jesus. Save me from my sin. And if you pray to prayer like that, follow it up with, thank you, Lord Jesus, for making me a son of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me a home in your heaven. Thank you for restoring my relationship with the one that created me. And then maybe you're here uh, today or you're listening online and you know you're saved. You spend years and years being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You know it. But sometimes you feel far. Sometimes you feel like God's not there. Sometimes you feel like there's distance. Sometimes you feel the static. Well, then pray this prayer with me now. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. Even after your glorious salvation, I still go back to the old ways. I still go back to the old things. I still act like I don't belong to you. I agree with you. That's horrible. I agree with you. I should have never said it. I agree with you. I should have never done it. I agree with you I should have never felt that way. I agree with you that I never should have been motivated that way. Forgive me. Take away the static. Take away the separation. And I know, Lord in heaven, because your word declares it, that you are righteous and faithful to make me feel that joyous, peaceful, victorious Christian life. Thank you for being a God that restores before salvation and after. Thank you for being that God. We love you and we praise you and do it in Jesus' name. Amen.